Good morning, guys. You guys have five minutes on the warm up. I really dislike it. Uh, I don't think it's really helping you get to your next step which your next step is your senior year or your next step is college. However you think about that, I do think it's kind of doing you a disservice. Um, it's important for you to note that if you are taking your March 13th grade, the exemptions that you will have earned, so drop lowest test grade, drop lowest quiz, drop lowest homework, will not apply to your March 13th grade. It is truly what your grade is on March 13th. So that's just something important to note. Um, and that's really the grade update, all right? Uh, any questions for me? Excuse me, Mr. Murray? Yes. So you said that um, uh, grades can be lower than the, uh, mid to, uh, the March 13th grade. So, so like right now, I have, I have an 83 in this class, and it uh -huh. used to be an 87. So yeah. when does that calculate to above what you had on March 13th? Good question. What it will happen is so, so Adam, for you, I'll just take you as an example. All right. Um, so since your grade is kind of close, I would continue to work as I I kind of in picture I picture that your grade is actually going to be higher than eighty seven at the end of the year. So I would continue to do what you're doing. Um, if for whatever reason it wasn't higher, let's say you stay at an eighty three for the remainder of the entire year. Um, then it would automatically take like your what's going to be posted on your report card uh, is going to be like whatever is the higher of the two grade. It's going to automatically do it. Oh, good. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, Sam, your grade can drop, but if your grade does drop, they'll just add the March 13th grade instead, if that makes sense. Lily, uh, the March 13th grade is your mid-semester grade. So if you go look on Infinite Campus at whatever you had during your mid-semester, that is what you, or Lillian, yeah, uh, whatever you had on uh, for your mid-semester grade, that is what your March 13th grade is.
other questions? So we're all good. You guys understand how this will work. Just want to give you a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Murray. Yes. So I have a question. Um, um, like, if you want to, if you don't want to keep your grade, mm -hmm. but you were absent and had excused absences, this is not just for your class, but for other classes. Um, and it's not really like you're doing like since i missed a quiz you have it on um my ap but other classes they they aren't ap so mm -hmm. how would i go about that to fix to fix my grade um even though that i wasn't here and then when i came back um it was the the pandemic I yeah guess. okay I get, so let me just make sure i understand what you're asking so you're saying you have incompletes or missings or something like that in a class, uh, and the teacher is not necessarily giving you the assignments that you can complete, so how do you complete that missing work? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so if the teacher cannot find a way for you to complete the assignment, and the only one for me that would be like that would be like a classwork report. Like I can't figure out a way to give you guys a classwork report. Uh, so what I'm going to do is all zeros will just disappear. The zeros for those assignments should not count. Um, that's why I'm going through and putting everything on my AP is so that you still have an opportunity to take all those assignments. Um, okay. And like, because I don't want to just excuse all those assignments. But let's say there's some teachers for whatever reason, they are, they're going to have to remove those zeros for you. That's the policy. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but um, my, okay. Another question: Who do we contact when um, when your teacher isn't really answering your emails or your parents' emails? Do like pertaining? Yeah. Good question. So I don't. I don't. I'm gonna just. This is what you should. You should email that teacher and just CC Mr. Dancer on the email. Okay. Copy Mr. Dancer. They should respond then. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Seven, do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm fine. Okay. Um, so let me go up. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, no, so Kuwait, you don't have to take your March 13th grade. And so some of you guys, like, let's say you're failing this class from March 13th. That, that grade is not final. You should, you don't really have an option. If you're failing at this point, you should just continue to do what we've been doing, which is continue to work, and we're gonna bring that grade up by the end of the year. It's not like it's permanently set there. Um, uh, Violet, yes, your grade, your grade can go down from March 13th, but um, if it goes down, then you'll just have your March 13th grade, not the grade that it ends up being. So it is possible, let's say you have a 95 in this class, um for your midterm it's possible right now that grades like an 87 um you will at the end of the year if you have an 87 at the end of the year or a 95 at the midterm then you will receive the 95 for the midterm yes you guys can still retake crash courses i'm really sorry i haven't posted those yet they are um they're coming I have just been very busy grading, and then we've had tons of meetings about all these changes that have been made. Yes, to bring up your grades, you just have to continue working on assignments that you give. Yes, I'm still planning on for every class, I'm going to drop lowest test, quiz, and homework grade. Uh, I've just decided to do that across the board. So it, I, I would say it's very unlikely for most of you that your grade will be lower at the end of the year than it was at the midterm. Uh, if I'm just being honest, I feel like the first half of the year compared to this half of the year is, is going to be easier just because you're having more open note stuff and it's kind of designed that way. Um, 
The only thing I will also add is that this class is slightly different because you still have an AP test that you need to take. Uh, so you still have incentive to keep working on this class unless like you just don't want to take the AP test anymore, which I would take um, no matter what. Like I, I think it's a, just a good experience to take it just to see where you're at. Eli, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was wondering like things that we take like or things that we took before March 13th but weren't graded till after March 13th, they just like still don't count, right? It's just whatever our mid-semester grade was. Correct, yeah. And that was yeah. like a big okay. conflict yesterday. Um, but yeah, no, that that is correct. So let's say, I'm trying to think if I don't know, I think I had pretty much everything graded, but I know I had some retakes that weren't graded and weren't put into the grade book before the March 13th grade was posted. Those retakes wouldn't count for your... March 13th grade. It's just whatever was posted by your teacher. Uh, Brittany, go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you know when the last day is for us to turn in work before grades are posted? Good question. Uh, that's probably a little different per teacher. So you'll probably want to ask your individual teacher. For me, the last thing that you're going to turn in is going to be your AP review, which is actually going to be the last week of school. Um, and that we are not having a final exam. I guess that's another update. Um, there will be no final exams. Um, so for us, basically, we will be done on May 15th. Um, and the, um, let me think. And then like all retakes and crash courses and things like that, those are gonna be done on, um, by May 15th. So May 15th is basically the last day you'll have to turn things in, except for your AP review, because you're actually going to turn that in the next week. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Tomorrow? Yes. So you just said we're not taking the final, right? But for test two, we st are we still going to be able to retake that or like? Okay, yeah, so for test two, let me talk about test two. So I've put test two in the grade book if you guys haven't seen it, it's in there. Um, so for test two, um, if you look on the screen, uh, there is going to be a makeup that's going to be posted next week. You'll have one week to do it. It will be multiple choice uh, questions and uh, each multiple choice question, you can get half a point back. You can't make higher than a 75 just like normal. I think it's going to be 30 multiple choice questions. You can get up to 15 points back. Okay, but then you said you're also going to exempt the lowest score. Correct. Correct. I mean, yeah, the test score. So I'm pretty sure it's my lowest test score. So should I just not retake it? You're, because... you're playing the game, Myle. That's right. All right, cool. Um. No, the last day of school is not May 15th, but because you guys are really gearing up for the AP test, um, there's no point in us doing anything after May 15th. Um, that will kind of be our last thing. Um, Brooklyn, same thing. Like I said, my final exam, the way I'm thinking about my final exam is the AP review, and that's going to be due right around your AP test. So there are some teachers who are doing a final project or doing some type of final assignment, but they may make theirs due like the final week and they may call that the final exam. So it's a little different for classes. Um, Mr. Murray, can you reiterate how we turn in the flashcards for the AP review? Yes, um, you are going to uh, probably turn in a hard copy of your AP review to me at some point. Um, and we're going to talk more about that in May. Uh, I'm kind of waiting to make sure I can get approval to do it, but it will still follow all social distancing guidelines and things like that. Basically, I'll be up at the school for like six hours for two days, um, and there will be a box that you'll just drop it in by my car. Okay, thank you. Yep. Adam, uh, work will stop on May 15th, basically. May 15th is kind of, you are want to think about it that way. You take your final exam on May 15th. Your final exam is your AP test. Think about it that way. Any other questions? You'll get your paper grades on Friday. 
I have 23 left. All right, any other questions? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I will, yes, I will try to figure that seven points out for the class that had that. What class are you in? Who is this person? Lily? Is that like Lily with just an A? There's no drop loss essay, unfortunately, Quay. All right. So now that you guys kind of understand all this, this makes sense to you. Um, let's go ahead and get into notes. Notes is a little bit longer today. Don't worry, Lillian. Sorry, there was somebody else who was talking. I was just trying to figure out who they were. Oh, before we do, here's the calendar. Again, you have two assignments that are due this week. Uh, you have Crash Course 37 to 38 and then Quiz 16. I've posted Quiz 16's review on my website. It should be helpful to you. Um, it is not for a grade. It's just to help you take Quiz 16. Uh, and then you have Period 3 review also because you should be working on that Period 3 for the AP test. So title of your notes for today is Nixon and Carter, the Cold War. So for Nixon and Carter in the Cold War, we're going to be talking about both of them. And Nixon, to me, is a fascinating president. Uh, he was a genius. Uh, and a lot of times when we talk about Nixon, we're going to talk about him pretty negatively. Um, but one thing that needs to be known is that he was a political genius. Now, that does mean political genius is not necessarily a straight compliment. It means he was great at deception. He knew how to manipulate people to get what he wanted. But he also really changed a lot about the Cold War. So let's go ahead and get into this. So when Richard Nixon became president, one of his campaign promises would be that he would stop the Vietnam War. This is one of the reasons why he was elected. But in his first year, the war actually got bigger. And it got bigger in a very controversial way. The United States actually invaded another country, which was Cambodia. Yeah, Eli, I, I, I got you guys. So Nixon invaded Cambodia. And the real reason why Nixon invaded Cambodia was because of this tunnel system that was being used by North Vietnam. North Vietnam would actually come down here into South Vietnam. And then a way to get to Saigon, Saigon was the biggest city right here, they would actually tunnel through Cambodia to then come in. Now, just so you know, if you're ever fighting an enemy and they're willing to dig hundreds of miles of tunnels through another country to get to you, you're probably not going to win that war. They want to beat you really, really badly. So what we did is we actually dropped a bunch of bombs on Cambodia to try to break up this tunnel. This led to massive protests because Cambodia was completely not involved in this war at all. These huge protests are going to be one of the major reasons actually why we leave the Vietnam War. So the U.S. wants to lead the Vietnam War with North Vietnam, but North Vietnam really likes that they actually have the U.S. on the ropes. 
they think it's pretty amusing that this small communist country has defeated the great and powerful United States. So they actually think about not signing a treaty with the United States to make the United States keep fighting in this war. And this is kind of where you'll start to see a little bit of Nixon's genius. Nixon is going to leak fake documents. And these fake documents are going to say that Nixon is thinking about dropping atomic bombs on North Vietnam. Now, Nixon was never intending on actually dropping atomic bombs on North Vietnam, but he wanted them to think that he would to bring North Vietnam to the peace table. And it worked. In those terms, one of the things that the United States wanted was to not sign a treaty. A treaty admits defeat. So one of the things that the United States got was to not call this document that they were signing a treaty. Instead, it was called the Paris Peace Accords. And this ended the war for the United States. Now, this was supposed to stop North Vietnam and South Vietnam from fighting as well, similar to Korea. But North Vietnam began to invade South Vietnam before the United States even left. And North Vietnam is eventually going to win. This unites Vietnam into one country, which it still is today. Vietnam is one country, and it is still a communist country. Anyone still need this slide? All right. Jeremiah, just let me know when you're done. So towards the end of the war, there is a new act that was passed called the War Powers Act. If you remember, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution had given the president the power to use troops without Congress's approval. So the War Powers Act just gives the powers back to Congress, to where Congress has to agree with the president to send troops to places. What's incredible is that this was the case until 2001. In 2001, Congress once again gave up their power to declare war with the president. They signed a new act, and that new act states that the president can unilaterally, meaning he doesn't need Congress's permission, to send troops anywhere he wants to to fight terrorism. Now, as you're writing, if you look at this picture to the right, this really explains a lot about Richard Nixon. First, you'll see that these guys who are standing next to Nixon are wind-up dolls. And that's because Nixon really surrounded himself with people who just 100% would agree with him all the time, no matter what he was thinking, or even if what he was thinking was wrong. Can you imagine if we had a president who just surrounded himself with people who would only agree with him, no matter how crazy he was acting? Cool country would be a mess today. And this is kind of explained down at the bottom. It says, imagine Congress trying to curb my right to conduct unconstitutional wars. Why that's unconstitutional.
And this was actually something Nixon said. He actually said it was unconstitutional for Congress to take this thing back. And that wasn't true. It was not true. Um, Congress could totally take their, their right back if they wanted to. Uh, same thing with today. Congress could still take back their right for the president to conduct wars on terrorism. The reason why Congress probably doesn't do that today is the optics, even though it's still their right to do it, the optics wouldn't look very good because what you could easily say is the president is basically saying you're taking the president's right away from fighting terrorism. Are you for terrorism? Congress for terrorism, you know, something like that. All right, anyone still need this slide? All right. Alrighty. Anyone else still need it? All right. So Nixon and China, this is where Nixon's genius really, really comes into play. So China had become communist. And when China became communist, their very, very best friends were the USSR. Nixon wanted to be cool with China. China's a massive country, and he wanted to sell goods to China, and he wanted China to sell goods to the United States. To do that, the United States and China had to become friends. And the way that this happened is the USSR and China began to disagree about things. The USSR felt like China wasn't being as communist as they wanted them to. And the United States played the great role of the listening friend from a couple that's going through some rocky moments. So let me explain. Maybe you've ever experienced something like this in your life. Maybe you like somebody. Maybe that somebody that you like is dating somebody else. And so what you do is you just kind of stand off to the side and any time that person has a problem with the person they're dating, you're the person that they talk to. You're the shoulder that they cry and you go, you know, I'm really sorry that that person's treating you that way, baby. That just, that's not right. I just want you to know if we were in a relationship, I'd never treat you that way. And China looks at the United States and goes, I know you wouldn't. You're really sweet. People don't tell you that that much. And this eventually starts to cause more and more disagreements actually between China and the USSR because China starts to tell the USSR, hey, you know what? The United States, they never treat me like this. They say I deserve better. And the USSR is like, China, why are you talking to the United States? And then you can begin to disagree about that. It gets all the way to the point to where in 1972, Richard Nixon goes to visit China. First president to ever visit China. And they have a really, really great time. Nixon is great at impressing the Chinese. The Chinese love Nixon. 
all the way up until his death, the Chinese loved Nixon. The Chinese actually captured a pilot 10 years after Nixon resigned from presidency in disgrace. They had some political prisoners. And Nixon was the one who was sent in secretly to talk to the Chinese because they loved Nixon so much. And Nixon looked at China and was like, China, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. China's like, I'm sorry, Nixon. I, I just missed you. And this begins to open up trade relationships between China and Richard Nixon. I can't speak if I've, if I've done this or not. Seven, beta male provider, that is, a, that is a great way to describe it. All right, anyone else still need this? To hear, I never stole any girls. I never dated a girl who didn't want to date me as well. All right, so the other thing that Nixon's going to do is he's gonna to try to calm down the Cold War. He created this idea called the Dantante. It's a French word. And it means to like ease or lower. He wanted to lower the tensions. So he did this with two different treaties. They were both called the SALT treaties. SALT stood for Strategic Arm Limitations Treaties. And what he wanted was he wanted for the United States and the USSR to lower the number of nuclear warheads that they had. During this time, the USSR had a ton of missiles. and the United States, we had a ton of hydrogen bombs. So the USSR actually had a lot more atomic weapons than we did, but all the nuclear weapons we had were big. It was kind of like, if we're going to use it, we're wiping out a whole city. So we negotiated to where we would actually drop the number of nuclear weapons that we had. Nixon's elected in 1968. And you can see in 1968, the United States really has already started to drop some of their nuclear weapons. And we continue to lower it a lot below Russia's. And the reason why we lowered it below Russia's was because it didn't matter. Having 800 hydrogen bombs or having 400 hydrogen bombs, you'd have more than enough bombs. And when we went lower than them, it showed the USSR that we were serious about this. So because of that, the USSR also began to lower their number. Now, it's funny because it doesn't really matter if you have 10 guns pointed at somebody or one gun pointed at somebody. Still a pretty threatening action, but for whatever reason, this really worked. It showed that the United States was willing to lower its power towards the USSR. And so when Nixon was president, we didn't really have any problems with Russia. You just disassemble the, the nuclear weapon to here. That's how you get rid of nuclear bombs. You don't actually, uh, the, radioactive or the radioactive part of the nuclear bomb we can't get rid of we just put it in a mountain in nevada what did you say salt stood for again a strategic arms limitation treaty
Yeah, right. And there's, there's definitely a possibility that you could lie about it. But um, for the most part, the United States had to provide proof that they were disassembling these weapons. Uh, I would probably say USC. Um, if we nuke Nevada, that would not be good. All right, anyone still need this slide? All right, no problem. Adam, you good, or you still need more time? All right, so just a little bit of a background about the Cold War. In the 1950s and on, there was a bunch of independence movements in the Middle East and Africa. The Middle East and Africa had been controlled by European countries, and they began to get their independence. If you look at this map right here, you'll see uh, years that these countries became independent. And there's a huge number of them that became independent from the 1940s to the 1960s. Every time a new country came into power, the U.S. or the USSR tried to control it. And what I mean by control, it means that who, is gonna, who are they going to listen to? If the USSR is telling them something and the U.S. is telling them something, if they're both telling them something, who is this country more going to listen to? We wanted to have friends in the Middle East and in Africa. Oops. The problem was most of these countries didn't like us. And it was for a very, very simple reason, which is right here, Israel. When Israel was created, we supported Israel's creation. Israel is a Jewish country. Ethnically, they're Jewish religious Lead, they're Jewish. Almost every other country you're looking at right here is Arab or is Arab and Muslim. Muslims and Jews do not get along. So we were trying to find very, very, in a very, very intense way, new friends. Anyone still need this slide? So the person who's gonna to try to get friends for us in the Middle East is going to be Jimmy Carter. This brings us to good old Jimmy Carter. Now, Carter is not going to be remembered very fondly as president. We'll talk about why that is a little bit today, but more of the next class. 
But that doesn't mean that Carter wasn't a good person. Actually, it's really interesting. Carter and Nixon are almost polar opposites of each other. Nixon may not be a very good human, but he was a really good politician. Carter is probably a really good human, but not a very good politician. Carter really wanted to focus on human rights, specifically in the Middle East. The problem is that's kind of a weird thing for a United States president to really focus on, is helping other countries in the Middle East become friends. His crowning achievement of this is called the Camp David Accords. The Camp David Accords brought fighting um, in the Middle East to a pretty big halt for a while. Now, Israel's major opponent that they had was Egypt. Egypt would get other Arab countries to also go attack Israel. So Carter thought that if he got Egypt and Israel to become friends with one another, that would create peace. And then that would also create more allies for us in the Middle East. So he negotiates a peace between these two guys. Egypt at this point hadn't even recognized that Israel was a country. Israel had a very, very small strip of land, about six miles, that Egypt wanted, mainly because of like holy sites. So Egypt gets the land and Israel gets to be recognized as a country and everyone seems happy. Now this does slow down fighting in the Middle East, but it did not create more friends for the United States in the Middle East because all the countries that Egypt used to have like influence over, they all now hate Egypt. Egypt's actually kicked out of a league of those countries called the Arab League. They basically tell Egypt, since you are now like hanging out with Israel, you're more Jewish than Arab. Pretty intense. To make matters worse, the guy who signed this for Egypt, he's on the left-hand side of this picture, he gets assassinated by his own people. The Jewish leader, who's on the right-hand side, he gets voted out of office. So it went both ways. We have eight slides. That is not the same. He got killed. He did get, yeah. I would agree that the, the Egyptian guy got it worse. To this day, Israel and Egypt still have some problems. The good news is it's not officially coming from the Egyptian president that they have problems with, but there are groups that operate in Egypt that bomb Israel periodically. Anyone still need this slide? No? All right. So Carter's big failure in foreign policy as a president is going to be the Iranian hostage crisis. Mr. Murray, why is this title so long? You can just type in, or you can just write Iranian hostage crisis if you want to, and then just write bad. Now, Carter supported a leader in Iran at this point. And we had a Today in History, I think about this with both classes. 
But this Iranian leader, he was not a very good guy. Iran was super poor. And this guy flaunted his wealth in ridiculous ways. The two most famous examples were that he would constantly have a private jet flown to Paris to pick up a soup that he liked, and he'd eat it every day for lunch. Which, when your country's starving to death, it's not great to spend $500,000 on a private jet to go pick up your soup. It doesn't matter how much you love the meal. And trust me, like, I get it. I love Willie's. If I could, I would eat Willie's every single day. So I, I know what it's like to have a favorite food, but you got you to gotta limit it. His wife also would bathe in milk a lot. Milk was a very big delicacy in Iran at this point. So it was basically like bathing in wine, like a really nice wine. And just a way to show off wealth. Jonah, I'm assuming you're saying that you haven't had Willie's in a while. I, I had Willie's Monday. Thank God they're still open. Probably couldn't keep going if they closed. So this Iranian leader is going to be overthrown by his people, and Carter is going to allow this friend of his to come to the United States. This makes the Iranians very upset because they want to kill this guy. So they go into the U.S. Embassy. The U.S. Embassy is a building in every country in the, United, or in the world, and it's U.S. soil, and it's where Americans go to solve issues if you're in a foreign country. And they hold 52 people hostage. Now, it is interesting some of the things that the Iranian hostages did. Or, sorry, the Iranian captives did for the hostages. So, for example, there were a couple of people that were working for the embassy that were not white. And they actually released those people because they said, hey, don't worry, your government hates you too. which been probably very interesting to hear that you are set free, which is a really good thing, but they're telling you you're being set free because your government hates you. But Carter refused to hand over the Shah, and then something really bad happened. The Shah died. So now they have no one to hand over. And so this Iranian hostage crisis goes on for 444 days, over a year. Carter tried to do a rescue mission. It failed miserably. Eight Navy SEALs died in the rescue mission. And Carter was not reelected. And one of the major reasons why he wasn't reelected is because the Iranian rebels stated that they would not release these hostages until a new president was put into office. And as soon as Ronald Reagan became president, the hostages were returned. And then we have one more slide. So I've thought about that quite. I actually ask them every single time if they are thinking about closing. And they haven't said yes once, but I, I feel like if they did say that they were going to close, I would just get a catering order of Willie's and I would just freeze it in my freezer. Um, and then just slowly, you know, try to ration myself and, and eat it still. So somebody said Mose or Chipotle was better. Would you go to war with them and make your statement that Willie's is better? So if you like, like, so I see Chipotle kind of, it's just like a fancy, it's fancy Willie's, but it's more expensive. Um, the burritos are more expensive. They charge you like two dollars for guacamole, and they don't give you chips. If you think most, uh, two of us are already telling. 
if you think Mose is better than Willie's, <laughs> you haven't been to the right Willie's. All right, anyone still need this slide? All right. So last slide. I will say like there are, there are smaller burrito places like uh, Bell Street, Bell Street burritos, it's good. It's kind of expensive, but it's, it's worth it. They're a local business. I'll support them. All right, you wanna go to the Willys on Howe Mill. It's the original Willys. All right, we'll finish our conversation about burritos in just a second, let me get through this. So the USSR invaded Afghanistan in 1980. And the reason why Afghanistan was having a civil war and the USSR wanted to make sure that the Soviet side won, that was the communist side won. This is very similar to the Vietnam War. Two sides are fighting. One, the U.S. liked, one, the U.S. did not like, so we join in to make sure the U.S. side wins. The USSR joins this war to make sure that their side wins. Now, we could not directly come and help. If we went and directly helped, we're all of a sudden in a full-scale war with the USSR. But what we did do is we secretly sent money to the Afghan rebels with weapons and training to be able to fight the USSR. Now, they didn't know the US was supplying it. They just knew that they were getting these packages. And how this would work is we actually funneled a lot of it through Egypt. So Afghanistan thought that Egypt was helping them, not the United States. And this allowed for the Afghani rebels to continually fight and just cause the USSR to bleed. And this war is gonna cost the USSR billions of dollars. And that's really important to know because the Cold War ended because the USSR ran out of money. They went bankrupt. And one of the reasons why they're gonna go bankrupt is because they fought this war with Afghanistan for eight years. Now, an interesting thing, a twist of fate, is the United States could not tell Afghanistan that they were the ones that helped out immediately after. So the Afghan rebels never knew that the United States helped them out. They had a civil war that led all the way through the 90s. And the group that was established, mainly using the weapons and training that the United States had funded, was a group called the Taliban. One of their major military leaders was a guy named Osama bin Laden. And so Osama bin Laden's first kind of rise to power and the way that he was able to start this terrorist organization called Al Qaeda actually came originally from secret funding that the United States provided. It wasn't one. So really the U.S. made the Taliban? Uh, in, a, in a certain way. Into this big terrorist group that it is now. Yeah, so just small thing, Taliban is the government of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is the terrorist organization. And um, the way you could kind of think about it is it's kind of like if we were fighting in a civil war and the um, Navy SEALs sided with one side of the civil war, that's kind of like how Al-Qaeda was. Al-Qaeda was kind of like the Navy SEALs. They were like really well-trained, well-organized fighter groups. So 
So if you want to watch a movie about this, I think that I think it is on Netflix. It's called Charlie Wilson's War. It's a very good movie, and it kind of goes through this whole idea. All right, so that's notes. If you guys uh, don't need anything else from me, uh, you're good to go. Make sure you do quiz 16 and crash course 37 and 38. We do not have anything on Friday planned. So you guys can have a good day. Um, Bell Street Burritos is a local burrito place. Uh, they have a couple different locations. One's on Peachtree Street, one's on uh, the Beltline. I don't know if they're open. I think, is it Natasha? Don't you work there? And Natasha says they're open. All right, and if no one needs anything from me, I'm gonna go ahead and end this meeting. Ray and they are not prone to accidental explosions at all. You actually have to do a lot of effort to cause a nuclear bomb to explode. All right, you guys have a good day. I'll see you later. Quiz 16 is due by 4 p.m. on Friday. Same thing with Crash Course, 4 p.m. on Friday.